It's pretty awesome when you get introduced by one of your heroes. It's kind of remarkable. And thanks to those of you brave Washingtonians that came despite the rain. Uh, I know that's a big deal for Washington. Uh, and I have to warn you in advance, my talks tend to have a lot of PowerPoints. It goes really fast, so fasten your seatbelts and start taking notes. In, uh, and I said fasten your seatbelt, but there we go. In 1918, Bernard was seven years old. The schools were closed in Baltimore, and the sleepy town had only one university hospital to get information from. He was stuck in his home by his parents, who said, there's a nasty epidemic out there. Your job is to sit in the living room window and count the coffins, the hearses, and who in the neighborhood has died. And so little Bernard did this. He kept a careful log. He was very proud of his math skills as he monitored the hearses coming up to collect the neighbors and haul them away. And he eventually grew up to be my Uncle Bernard. He married my brother's sister Bernice and became a physician. And from the two of them, I learned a great deal about the epidemic. But today, that generation is gone. We no longer have the oral histories except those that were recorded. So we have to go back and think, what was it like in 1918? And as KG told you, World War I was underway. It had begun in July of 1914. It was a truly brutal war, fought largely in trenches over tiny, tiny bits of real estate. Uh, nine million combatants died, seven million civilians. We have no idea how many of either of those numbers actually died of the flu. And the, it was the worst epidemic unfolding towards the end of World War I. In fact, the war continued despite the surge in influenza. As part of this war, and something that really never gets thought about in terms of susceptibility to respiratory infection, was the first widespread use of gas warfare. And thousands, if not millions, of civilians and soldiers were exposed to mustard gas and chlorine which left them often with permanent damage to their lungs, their eyes, and generally throughout their bodies. It was also a bombing war with uh, fo folks hunkered down in trenches and bombs coming out of nowhere to kill them. To put it in perspective, you had uh, this moment, I want to go back, if I can make this work. Can I? <clears throat> this does not work. Um, to put it in perspective, the UK sent 5.5 million soldiers, 900,000 plus died. On October 12th, just a month shy of the end of the war, General March demanded more troops and Woodrow Wilson said to him, General, I wonder if you have heard this limerick. I had a little bird and its name was Enza. It was a poem about influenza. Wilson had real second thoughts. Should we send troops? One of the problems we had as we faced this epidemic, and I, when I say we, not just America, all over the world, was that our soldiers and our nurses and our doctors were all somewhere else. The majority of the medical establishment was not here in the United States, particularly uh, physicians under 40 were on the battlefields overseas when influenza broke out, something that was encouraged by this institution, the National Academy. And nurses were, uh, we had, didn't have enough of them. We sent those that we had overseas. They had a kind of angelic presentation in that day. They were highly revered by the general public, uh, but we had a huge deficit of nurses on the home front with thousands and thousands sent into the battlefields or immediately behind the battlefields in the rehabilitation centers. So when flu emerged and uh, starting amongst our soldiers in Kansas, the framework of discussion was limited because just before, because of the Bolshevik Revolution, the, uh, Congress passed the Espionage Act, which made it illegal to say anything bad about the United States government. And then the Sedition Act was put through uh, shortly thereafter. And literally any attempts to criticize the government's response to influenza in our military was considered a violation of the Sedition Act. And so uh, when you look at the record, you say, why is there so little written history of this epidemic? Why actually do we have this dearth of information? And part of the answer 
answer is it was illegal to write critical information. And in fact, you had articles like this, ah, Spanish flu, schmoo, it's just another flu, no big deal. And this was the main kind of public response that came out, not just in the United States, but all over the world, until eventually it was clear this was not just regular flu, and you couldn't lie to the public, you couldn't fake it. It had a very distinct presentation even as early as July 2018 as evidenced by this coroner's report from London where he was doing autopsies and said never in his life had he seen a syndrome like this. Some of the observations I dug up include that 20,000 people died in New York City in just six weeks. And in the same time period, 1 20th of the population of Ghana perished, 19% of Western Samoa. If you look at all respiratory deaths, you see a 37% increase in Kentucky. And you see a massive increase in premature mortality among one-year-olds or under one-year-olds across the United States. There was no clarity about what this was. Viruses were barely understood to exist. It was the main theory forwarded in the United States uh, scientific establishment, including by this institution, was that it was bacillus influenza, a bacterial disease. Dr. Rupert, who was the Surgeon General, tried to summarize the state of knowledge, much as today you might see Tony Fauci put in this role, to try and explain to the people, we actually don't know, but we don't want you to panic. Somehow we want you to uh, get some idea of what it is, but we're not sure. And the result was all kinds of crazy ideas were out there about what this was and how you could protect yourself. Maybe it came from Chinese people. Maybe it was air from Germany. Maybe it was unclean pajamas, uh, cosmic, and as a result, government actions were helter-skelter. In Canada, they canceled the Stanley Cup and shut down Toronto. That was a good idea. Some places shut down churches, some didn't. Schools, yes, no. You had all kinds of very, very different actions taken in every single part of the world. There was no consistent pattern to how government chose to respond to the influenza. Hygiene was a big plus, and there was a sense that you just clean the street and somehow the flu goes away, or put a spray of some sort on the public transit. There was a massive need to recruit volunteers because so much of our nursing staff was overseas, and huge attempts by government to come up with incentives for people to step into harm's way and volunteer to help fight influenza. In every place you looked, very few people so volunteered. It was so phenomenally frightening. Masks. There was a sense that the mask could protect you, though nobody knew really what kind of mask and how well it protected and when you should wear it and whether it should cover your nose only or your mouth or you should have a special nasal breathing <laughs> device. And most governments gave some sort of, yes, you should wear a mask message, but no further clarity than that. And so you had people venturing into public spaces wearing masks, nobody really knowing if it worked, and in some cases enforcement included shooting you uh, if you failed to appear in public wearing a mask. Warehousing. Every single hospital was filled to capacity, clinics, and so on, and so giant warehouses like this basketball arena were created all over the world, and you saw people just stacked like books on a bookshelf or in tents outdoors. Um, where whatever volunteer personnel and actual trained health personnel could be found would care for them or remove their dead bodies um, for burial. The warehousing may in fact have helped spread disease because if you didn't have flu when you went into the warehouse, you sure got it before you got out of the warehouse. And so this is one of the problems with having to concentrate the ill. As warnings uh, went out, there were all sorts of advice about what can't, would it be safe on the subways or not? Would you be safe walking out in public or not? The, we ran out of coffins. Almost every single city in the United States ran out of coffins. And so mass burials occurred, some with unmarked graves. All over the world, schools were closed down, and this meant that children had nothing to do. And they were told, go home and just stay in bed till it's all over. <laughs> or at least stay in bed when you feel lousy. Don't go out, don't see anybody, don't talk to anybody. If there were public events, you had to have the World Series, you wore masks. Uh, but in general, the, atten the 
as the <coughs> epidemic worsened one locality after another, there were fewer and fewer outdoor events and more and more use of the police to enforce such things as closures of theaters and, and not spitting, not coughing, uh, not sneezing in public. Um, any of these could, in various municipalities, re result in rather severe penalties, even jail time. And it would be truly uh, prohibited enforced by police. Churches were often closed. Those that remained open often became warehouses of the sick. Orphanages, schools were turned into orphanages. New York City created 31,000 orphans in six weeks and they filled the schools. Quarantines were imposed as acts of control. Um, and in some cases, undue optimism would appear. It's all over now, it's okay. Oops, wait, we were wrong. And perhaps one of the things that spawned the third wave was armistice celebrations, which took place on November 11th while flu was still raging and nobody wore masks. They were out celebrating that the war was over. There were artificial cures, phony baloney products of all sorts being marketed, and in some cases just God marketed as the solution. Often people gathered in churches where the disease spread. Though it was rare, there were people who died in less than 24 hours from onset of first symptoms to death. And in general, this was not a normal flu. People had profound hemorrhaging, coughing up blood, uncontrolled bleeding from their eyes. They were in super high fevers, delirious. Uh, they had, it was as if the entire epithelial lining of their lungs was disappearing. Um, and in many cases, as David Morans from NIAID puts it, it behaved completely differently from what had previously been seen. It came in three waves. The first one was a mild wave. The second, in just six weeks' time in the fall, was the super killer wave. And then a third, somewhat more dampened and moderate wave circled the planet. All of this in basically nine months' time. It was called Spanish flu, had nothing to do with Spain. It actually came out of Haskell County, Kansas, and I think John Barry's book presents very convincing evidence to prove that this came out of Fort Camp Funston and military encampments in Kansas. Um, and that is how it was spawned and spread because of troop movements. There were, of course, ancient pandemics. We don't know a lot as we go further back in time, but we know that as early as the 1100s, a great influenza pandemic swept across Europe. One of the things you see as you go through the history of these pandemics is they all were, quote, coming out of Russia. In, in all likelihood, they were coming originally from China, spreading across Siberia into Russia and then into Europe from the east. And via trade routes, slavery, and general uh, colonial uh, mechanisms were spreading from Europe to their colonial outposts in the Americas and Africa and Asia. Um, as the, the last really big one in 1889, swept across the entire planet and had a particularly high death toll for young adults aged 21 to 40. Um, there, the, as peak mortality in several of these outbreaks was actually in young adult populations. And this becomes more and more significant uh, a factor as we look forward to what would be appropriate strategies for mass vaccinations of populations and how do we understand what flu really is. Something definitely happened in 1918 because a 100% bird-adapted virus without going through an intermediary species turned into a human-to-human -human transmitting virus and spread via the network of railroad lines and shipping lines all over the world to claim in almost every place it went extraordinary numbers of dead. How many? We are still debating today and this tells us the paucity of our records, how many really died in 1918 and 19. It goes from a lowball estimate made in 1927 of about 21 million, all the way up to estimates well over 100 million. If, if you put that high end in perspective, you would see we would have millions and millions of dead today were a similar pandemic to strike. It was also highly variable. One part of Iran experienced 40% mortality. Native populations in the Yukon and Alaska and, and in parts of the Pacific had 100% mortality. 
The record keeping, of course, was scratched into paper, and I went through some original records for the United States, and here's what I was able to see. First of all, if you, broke, if you just looked at death rates, you saw a huge increase in death rates between 1917 and 18, anywhere you looked, every single state. You also saw a huge increase in what was officially called flu, but more importantly, in respiratory health. Uh, and those probably were flu deaths and may or may not have been counted in anybody's guesstimate of the ultimate number of people who died of influenza in the United States. And here we had record keeping, although in some cases the record keeper was the coroner or the mortician, not a physician, not a nurse. We clearly had a, this sort of W effect, as they call it, in epidemiology circles, where you, instead of having a death toll that rose with age, with normal flu, the death toll dropped and then skyrocketed for young adults and then down. Um, and the general number given for American mortality is 675,000 souls, but that is surely an underestimate. And very clearly it had an effect on not only mortality in America and Europe, um, but also on life expectancy. And again, we're basing this on very poorly kept records. Um, hand scratched, hand estimated, um, in many cases subject to damage, never properly microfiched. So it's, it's amazing the paucity of accurate information that we actually have. But we do learn from this as we look forward that flu is a bird virus and that when tragedy strikes, it's because flu jumps from birds to people in a form that can spread from human to human, which it did again via passing through pigs in 2009 uh, when H1N1, the virus that caused 1918 outbreak, continued to lurk in our environment all the whole century and still does today. In 2009, it passed through pigs, probably in the pork industry in the Midwest of the United States, but the first recorded case was little Edgar Hernandez in Veracruz, Mexico. He survived. He was sometimes called patient zero for the 2009 pandemic, but uh, in fact, it's, I think, quite clear that the epidemic's first outbreaks, its first breakthroughs to the, our species occurred previously back in 2008 when you had isolated cases of pig to human transmission of this H1N1 strain, um, often involving uh, county fairs where children were playing with competing pigs um, and were directly exposed uh, you know, kids can't resist touching a pig's snout. <sighs> Don't do that. And in, in San Diego County and Imperial County, California, there were two children v taken very sick um, with uh, uh, H1N1 flu before uh, the first reported case in Mexico. So there, I think we're, we're fuzzy on exactly when all this transpired. But after Mexico, it makes its way to New York City uh, via kids returning from Easter break vacation in Cancun. Mexico paid a big price for being 100% transparent, for warning the entire world in a timely fashion, and for doing not only no cover-up, but for ordering, sorry, its own schools, offices, businesses, restaurants closed to stop the spread of this virus. By drawing its dramatic attention to the outbreak in a, in a you know, really laudable form that few governments have been willing to do, Mexico paid a big price because the world started to see it as Mexico's problem and Mexico gave us this epidemic and we got to stop Mexicans. And as you know, it doesn't take much to turn a president into an anti-Mexican. Um, in Mexico, there, the army was deployed, handing out masks and forcing their use all over the country. Um, it, the churches were closed and, uh, or it, for certain ceremonies opened, but people were required to wear masks when attending. Uh, and most mass transit was either empty or in special cases people were allowed in wearing masks. They tried to limit social contact by practicing distancing as much as possible, getting people to stay a fair distance from one another, minimizing their likelihood of receiving virus from a carrier that might not know they were even infected. Um, 
and some Mexicans tried to take it all with a good sense of humor. Uh, but in the end, it spread wildly from Mexico, and it was in no time at all that this virus was actually a global phenomenon, and it was already spreading rampantly in the United States, even as Mexico was taking such radical steps to control its own outbreak. Uh, again, laudable efforts to minimize the crisis in their country. By May 6th, all of Mexico's uh, limitations were lifted, and by then, of course, it was a global phenomenon, so Mexico no longer sort of held the burden. Interestingly, 71% of the cases in Mexico that were identified were 29 years and younger. So it was showing this pattern that had been seen in 1918 that signaled cause for great concern, a virus that especially attacks young adults. Traveler alert was issued on April 28th by our Centers for Disease Control, and the world responded by canceling Mexico, penalizing Mexico. Any traveler coming from an airplane that had originated or passed through Mexico had to go through body scans. If they showed any temperature at all, they were detained and placed in quarantine. In many airports, uh, they were required to wear masks of one form or another, whether or not anybody thought they actually worked. This one certainly would not. It would have no effect whatsoever in limiting spread. Um, British Airways had a huge drop in the, in the stock market, as did Aeromexico and a number of the airlines. And on May 1st, WHO issued its own s statement saying, these travel restrictions make no sense. You can't stop the virus at, in an airplane. Nevertheless, Ch the Chinese government detained an Aeromexico flight and put everybody on the flight in quarantine um, until finally they allowed it to return to Mexico. Similarly, a flight in Shanghai, um, a flight in Hong Kong, flight in Singapore, people were detained sometimes for up to 30 days, placed in hotels or in isolation facilities um, simply because they had come first from Mexico and then later uh, Americans from the United States. In South Korea, small children were even detained uh, if they were flying from the United States to South Korea. Everywhere in the world you saw these signs go up. This is Singapore. Alert, you may be detained if you're from, look at that, United States of America. So Mr. Trump, it works in both directions. And uh, passengers that did fly in many parts, even to neighboring countries from Mexico, were required to wear masks on board and as they left. And again, there's little evidence that the kind of mask people were wearing would have been at all protective. Um, intense security way off in Lahore, Pakistan, wherever you looked around the world, you saw the same response. And it didn't do any good. And the smart Canadians said, hey, everybody left Mexico, we got the whole beach to ourselves. Meanwhile, the world was running out of masks. And as it turns out, most of the masks that you buy in your local drugstore are made uh, in the Philippines or Southeast Asia, and they started hoarding supplies. There's, the, there started to be a flooding of the markets with fake Tamiflu that was either useless or, worse yet, contained some other toxic chemical of some sort. Um, Switzerland is the major manufacturer of Tamiflu, the only drug that was then approved and thought to be at all helpful, and they were hoarding supply and had committed most of their supply for sale to the United States. Nobody was making enough for the world. Schools were closed all over the world, much as they had been in 1918, and this model estimates that school closures may have actually worsened the problem. Certainly there were a huge number of deaths uh, at least tenfold more than the WHO's official estimates uh, in 2009. Perhaps more than 200,000 pandemic respiratory deaths uh, were uh, actually experienced. In Germany, they did an estimates for each of the four big pandemics of recent history. They showed a trend that yes, they got a smaller and smaller and smaller death toll, which could be quite comforting. But if you looked around the world, you saw that there was a very high attack rate and mortality rate with what we think of as a pretty wimpy virus, as it turns out, the 2009 H1N1. Um, and it was not wimpy if you were a pregnant woman by the way, they took the highest death rate and the highest uh, need for intensive hospitalization. But uh, this was definitely a pandemic that spread worldwide with strong consequences. 
Um, another estimate is 200,000 respiratory deaths, 80, 83,000 CVD deaths, um, and that 80% of the respiratory and ca uh, cardiovascular deaths were under 65 year olds. What would a modern pandemic mean? Well, a number of different estimates have been made to come up with what are the real numbers in the past and what might they look like going forward. Chris Murray's estimates, um, he sees that in 1918, the guesses varied 30-fold. Uh, am I pointing it the right place? Where, did, where do I point to make this go back? Can you go back? Go back? Is anybody helping? Hello? Hello? Okay, Whew. that was hard. Uh, uh, Chris Murray's extrapolations are that in 1918, guesstimates of the actual scale, he puts it around 62 million, but could be well over 100. Um, and that if that happened today, it would be a 114% increase in total mortality across the world. Um, a very new analysis put together by a fan, Jameson and Larry Summers, estimates that we would have 720,000 pandemic deaths annually in the current medical context. In other words, with the toolkits and the vaccines that we have, and that they would cost about 0.6% of global GDP or $500 billion. Um, other guesstimates of cost analysis and see huge differences with and without available vaccine, about a $10 billion differential in global cost, um, basically because of different numbers of people absentee from work. Um, and we can see a, a clear trend analysis of what it would look like and what kinds of numbers you might be looking at in terms of actual deaths um, going forward. All of this is guesswork because it depends on the famous, you know, garbage in, garbage out for any modeling exercise. But any way you look at it, you're, you're going to have at least a half a point uh, GDP loss and possibly two or three percent GDP loss with a serious global pandemic with high mortality rates. Well, a <clears throat> hundred years ago, they didn't have antibiotics. They didn't have vaccines. They didn't have ventilators and all these fancy schmancy. So wouldn't it just be a puny problem today? I mean, couldn't we just face down the 1918 flu if it became forward today because of all these wonderful assets that we now have that didn't exist in 1918? No. And here, let me give you my cause, reasons for great concern. Let's take first a look at what it would mean, you know, what differential do we get out of the vaccine phenomenon? Well, first of all, in 1918, the peak mortality was just six weeks long. Nobody makes vaccines in six weeks. And the first wave looked so mild, you might not have mobilized for mass vaccination production. We are seeing a decline in funding for basic research and universal vaccines. And while WHO has boosted supply with adjuvant, they still can at best hit a billion out of 7.2 billion humans. A recent poll shows most parents in the United States of America will not, they are not favoring vaccinating their children. And more than half believe that you can get flu from the vaccine. So that why would you give a vaccine? I don't want my child to have the flu. If you look at which parents in the blue do vaccinate their kids for flu versus in the orange which don't, their feelings, it's like they're looking at a two different worlds and in interpreting risk, uh, even if they're matched for college education and, and economics. Um, a third think, you know, the flu shot is a conspiracy. Whatever, I don't know who's conspiracy, but there it is. And 28% say it can cause autism. You can't save lives with a vaccine if people won't use the vaccine. Antibiotics. We have rising antibiotic resistance across all the bacterial uh, species that we'd be most concerned about for respiratory infection. Only uh, 12 new antibiotics have been licensed since the year 2000, and so many companies have left the field that we're down to only four big companies even maintaining any R&D for, for antibiotics. Antivirals. We see rising resistance uh, against the viruses from the handful of antiviral products that we have, and they are made in small quantities, and there's a tradition of nations hoarding supplies. We have never seen antivirals be available for international distribution. They have always ended up hoarded in specific 
wealthy countries. And Congress here has never paid for more than 31 million people to obtain. What about improved respiratory support? Well, we're short two million ventilators, according to the American Public Health Association, and many of our hospitals already operate at full capacity. There is no surge capacity margin, either in personnel or direct facility. So it's not clear that we have some fancy schmancy ICU <coughs> capacity. What about the skilled labor force? Certainly we have more doctors and nurses today than did in 1918, but only 38% agree to be vaccinated last year for flu. So they're willing to be right up close and personal with flu carriers without being vaccinated themselves. And we should expect a high absentee rate uh, as flu spreads. We see this in every outbreak because they stay home with their children. It's not. It's not a, a, a terrible thing, but obviously they want to be with their kids. What about the absence of World War I scale intense combat? True. However, what we do see today is an increase in attacks on Red Cross workers, healthcare workers, MSF all over the world. Healthcare workers are now targets. That Red Cross is a big darn target. Um, and we have seen record numbers of healthcare workers assassinated and kidnapped in the last five years. What about governance? Yes, we have a strong World Health Organization, which didn't exist in 1918, but before two Ebola outbreaks, which KG mentioned earlier, we were already 78, only at 78% of funding goal for emergency response capacity by WHO. That is now exhausted by the two uh, outbreaks, and they are in begging mode for funding. And the health security agenda. Well, for full compliance, I mean literally full compliance, only 39 nations have achieved that at this point. Um, and the billion dollar investments made under the Obama administration, it's not clear uh, how much of any of that will continue as we go deeper into the Trump administration. And so, uh, and no other country except Germany has really stepped up to the plate and said, okay, we'll come in with a, a big commitment to maintain it. This institution, held a historic meeting in 2005 looking at the threat of pandemic flu. And I think this summary point that the nations, the poorest nations will bear the brunt of a future pandemic is true. Partly because supplies will be hoarded in the rich countries, because borders will be closed, because laboratory capacity is wildly different in one nation to another, because many will resort to harsh action, bring in the police, and because of scaremongering, internet, and cable television. And then finally, I want to turn to the changes in our planet, which I think are increasing risk for all of us. What the heck is this Asian Mandarin duck doing in Central Park right now? And where did it come from? And how did it end up there? Well, you could say it's just a pretty little duck, what's the big deal? But what we're seeing all over the planet right now is a shift in latitudes of uh, migration patterns for and habitats for all sorts of species because of climate change. And in particular for fish that are predated, predated upon by the aquatic bird species that carry influenza. Um, cod have moved so far north that when I was in Greenland, the fishermen were complaining they couldn't find cod anymore. We are, we are seeing all over the planet this massive movement of species range, and as the species shift, their predators will shift. So the red Asia flyway is the key flyway we are concerned with when we talk about influenza. It is uh, migratory aquatic birds on this flyway that are the chief reservoirs of this virus, or family of viruses. Um, how climate change and the various uh, changes in fish movement and so on on the planet are affecting that flyway is really not quantified. I haven't seen, I've dug hard, I, as far as I could tell, nobody's really doing the work and researching it, but it would indeed change influenza risk. Thank you. So everyone, I think that we're running a little behind, but I think that this is really a good time to take the opportunity to ask Lori any questions. So 
Let me throw it open for a few minutes. Any questions for, uh, for Lori? There are microphones. Yeah, and there are microphones. Please. It's working. Just start hollering and it'll... Hi, my name is Pia McDonald from RTI International. I've gone through and looked at a lot of the literature around risk for infectious disease outbreaks, but also risk of where <coughs> pandemic influenza might emerge from. And I've noticed that there is not well-documented risk maps. Talking to people, many believe that pandemic influenza will originate from Asia, but your documentation points very differently in terms of where pandemic influenza has emerged in the past? Well, actually, I would beg to differ. I think, we, I think it's pretty clear that every major pandemic originated in China, or at least it's clear from the point at which it gets into Siberia. Um, the, the second wave of the 1918 flu uh, emerged out of Haskell County, Kansas, but it was based on a virus that was the first wave virus that had come from China. So I think, I think we're very clear that the issue is birds, and we're gonna hear more later today from some of our speakers about what the role the birds play and why the virus can adapt to humans. Okay, I just thought you said that like the 2009 originated maybe in the U.S. Midwest ah, through swine Good point. All right, so let me clarify that. Okay, um, thanks. H, the H1N1 virus, it, it, everything, every H1N1 that's in the world today is a son or daughter of the 1918 strain. And the, at some or all of its eight genes are, are a descendant. Oops, yikes, that is terrible, sorry, is, is a descendant from the 1918 virus. What happened in 2009 was that it passed through swine. And it may indeed, and I think um, perhaps Tony will speak to this, but I think we have a pattern in the United States with H3N2, with H1N1, um, that viruses that, ha that have caused outbreaks in humans don't just like suddenly disappear, they go into other species and often it's in our country, our most concentrated form of livestock where we just really pack them in is our pork industry. And we do see constantly these viruses emerging out of that paradigm, often in these isolated cases with kids at county fairs. And if you start paying attention to these Midwest County Fair reports, you'll see it's a, it's a fairly frequent seasonal event that kids are hanging out with the pigs and here comes the virus. Now, that appears to be what happened in 2009. Any other questions? I'm just a visitor here, but my, my question is about um, polio. And um, we often, we talk a lot about the Spanish flu outbreak, and justifiably so, but we don't talk too much about the origins of our polio outbreak, which occurred, I think, in 1919. 1916. 1916. And um, could you explain that a little bit more? Where did it, where did it first originate? Uh, what's okay, well, the history a little, of the polio? A little polio? off topic, but I'll give you the nutshell yes. version. Okay. Um, pol polio is actually a, an odd consequence of the hygiene revolution. Um, it's a virus that is, was historically at very, very low level present in water supplies, um, sewage systems and so on, uh, rarely caused actual in disease because from infancy humans were exposed to the virus and developed immunity towards it. What happened with the hygiene revolution is that we started having clean water and we started separating our access to sewer systems so that we were cleaning sewers and um, you know, our, our hygiene improved, and so babies' access and exposure to this virus uh, disappeared. And you flash forward in time after you have a, a number of years pass of this hygienic revolution, um, here comes the one exception, this tiny RNA virus 
that is able to get through all the filtration systems that were in use in those days, and you start to get human exposure without uh, child exposure that immunized. And so we suddenly had a population in the United States of totally vulnerable, non-immune children, a whole generation, and that's what started the polio epidemic. And if there's somebody who knows more about it and wants to correct my rendition, I'm happy to hear it. Any other flu questions? Hello, my name is Christopher Eddy. I'm with All One Health Systems, LLC. I'd just like to thank you so much for the coming plague. It did ch indeed change my life. I had it on my desk as environmental health director for over 10 years under my dictionary. Um, I'd you. like to know if you have any thoughts about uh, alternate transmission pathways and in influenza, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, such as fecal oral uh, contaminated surfaces, fomites, and how significant some of those could be in the future? It's a really good question. Let me just put it in a, in a context for the whole audience. What, you know, if, if we today said, uh-oh, it's happening. There's a really nasty bug out there and it's carrying with it tremendous virulence, and it seems to be, like the 2009 virus, very, very efficient at human-to-human -human transmission, then everybody in this room and all of your friends and family would want to know, how do we protect ourselves? And that would immediately go to, what do we know about exactly, you know, how important is sneezing versus, thank you for the sound cue over here, coughing. <coughs> How, how, much does washing your, how much does washing your hands matter? Uh, you know, is there any kind of mask that act, actually keeps this virus out? Um, if so, where do I get you know, 5,000 of them? Um, and you go on and on down the list, and what you can see is that there are practical recommendations that I'm sure everybody in this room would follow, because you would for any infectious agent. Uh, you know, wash your hands, cover your mouth when you're coughing, that sort of thing. But as you get further down to real hardcore specifics, you see that there's a tremendous amount of unknowns. And uh, there's only a couple of countries that have ever really done large-scale studies to try and figure out what might work. Japan, it may not surprise you, is one of them. And they, in one of their large studies, they basically showed that the masks, the, it seemed like the major efficacy of a mask is that it causes alarm in the other person. <laughs> and so you stay away from each other. And that's what I think happened with SARS. When I was in the SARS epidemic, I saw everywhere, all over Asia, people started wearing these masks. And it is alarming when you walk down a street and everybody coming towards you has a mask on. You definitely do social distancing. You definitely, it's just a, a gut thing. But did the mask really help them? Did the mask keep the virus out? Almost certainly not. If, they, if the virus was in their, around their face, the mask would not have made the difference. So. Um, I think this is an area that's always been under-researched, underfunded. It's not a sexy area, and it's not an area that results in product development that somebody sees as highly lucrative. So, I mean, do, if you put that Purell stuff on your hand all day long, is it really doing anything for you? Is it really, and would it protect you from influenza? I, you know, I'm not the one to say what you should do. I'm not a licensed physician, so I cannot give you medical advice. But what I will say is that I think we are, this is an area that needs a great deal more attention. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Lori.